Well, it's great to be here. It's a little intimidating. In front of, I, I love the, uh, the lineup this afternoon, all my friends, my brilliant friends. And uh, I like doing a tag team with Yvonne. Um, OK, I see already that I've, I've got myself in trouble because I'm wearing the wrong pair of colors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, George Washington really exhibited his troops by saying, I've gone blind in the service of my country. I can't quite say that, but anyway. So um, I'm going to be going over some of the ground uh, that Susan covered this morning, but with less knowledge. So that's a, a little bit of a problem. Scrambling to prepare, I guess swatting, is that the word? I was scrambling to prepare for this uh, conference. I knew not, not, virtually nothing about Amory, except at the mind's limits. And even a few weeks ago, when uh, Susan asked me for a title in order to make the deadline of the brochure, I didn't really have a clear idea of what I was going to say, especially to an audience like this. So my first idea, um, even though it's uh, paradoxical, it's still not true. See, it comes from a kind of swift reading of the philosophical essays, and particularly the ones you talked about, the, uh, the uh, waggish remarks about Adorno and Foucault and so on. Um, and uh, I was very struck, like Susan was, particularly by this idea of the fear of banality. And of course, why is it so striking? Because it's not a banal idea at all. It's just like the most, it's like the most un, you know, if you're like me, I teach in a law school, I have to read long law school articles. They are so banal. And fearing, I mean, avoiding banality seems should be a high principle of intellectual life. But of course, so it is a counterintuitive idea of his. And it does have, of course, a very strong um, point, uh, even though Counterintuitive thinking can be opening doors. It can also be something superficial and just a, 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 a denial of common sense, which often is what he's talking about. Um, let's see if I can. All right, uh, this addiction to paradox. And um, although I came away really, really, the more I read, the more I admire Amory and in kind of in awe of him, uh, I would rather uh, have titled this talk, guess what, enlightenment and despair. Now, I don't know if it's good despair, but, but in, there is a connection. And the two Amoris really can't understand them separately, obviously. Um, and it's kind of in line with what David asked earlier about suicide and so on. I'm not, um, okay, I'm not I'm, I don't want to be fair here to Foucault and to Adorno and so on, but I did have a lot of fun reading uh, Amoris' uh, uh, polemics, uh, very polemical, as strong polemics against them. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of ink and I've written a lot about anti-enlightenment traditions, starting with Demestra, and they're all, they're all, uh, there's a kind of permanent structure of counter-enlightenment thought in different settings. It's amazing how similar it is over the decades and even over two centuries. Um, often, one of the ideas is that science is both Promethean and hubristic, and on the other hand, it gives you no moral guidance. So if there's something really vacuous about it, um, a science of scientific a science is a very disturbing kind of authority because it invites criticism. What kind of authority is that? So there's a kind of there's a worry about, or there's an antagonism to the scientific mind. And if you look at the origins, the first, the 19th century version of the dialectic of enlightenment. It was that reason is self-defeating because it is a war against religion. And religion is the basis of civilized life. It's a rebellion against God. Secularization is the crisis of the West. Um, the philosophers who destroyed religion were sawing off the branch they were sitting on. And, uh, and how, after all, how will people behave if they don't think they're being watched by a punitive power? What if you actually um, uh, made it, put in the school curriculum the philosophy of Jacques Monod, as, as Amory describes it. You know, we are insignificant flecks of organic matter flung arbitrarily through empty space and so on. That's not very, uh, I don't know, it doesn't really uplift you. So it makes you ask, um, particularly if enlightenment uh, means that, as Amory says, man is alone in an unfeeling immensity of the universe in which he has emerged by chance. Uh, and that's a challenge. I, I think that's what the most of the early counter-enlightenment theorists were very afraid of. They said, you can't say that. 
if you do say that, uh, only very few people, this Leo Strauss, you know him, only a few people can actually respond to this and live a life of dignity. So it's a kind of, uh, the idea that you can make this a public philosophy is, uh, was a strong counter enlightenment. You couldn't do that. Plus, I think I just don't want to say a few words, not in favor of the counter enlightenment, but there are intuitions there that are not so easy to dismiss. So for example, it's true that historical achievements and great cultural achievements of the past sometimes were motivated by, driven by, uh, fostered by um, dogmatism, false certainty, uh, arrogance, aggression, inequality, hierarchy. It's not as if those things which are very unliberal and had no, didn't create anything, they did. So are, and are you willing to denounce everything created by say false certainty? in the world because you believe in reason, or um, there is a kind of extreme liberalism which says that all disagreement can be resolved by persuasion, compromise, or privatization of, the, of ideas. But there's a lot of conflicts that are deeper than that, and you can't resolve by reason, and you can't avoid them either. So over, well, you've talked about the limits of reason, the limits of the mind. I have one example I really like, I think someone mentioned John Stuart Mill. Was that you, James? Mill has this great line. He says, uh, if, you, uh, if you tell a man who is beating his wife and his children that he would be happier if he didn't do that and if he could take pleasure in their pleasure, he will beat them harder uh, because people aren't responding. <laughs> human be there is something in the human, where's Moshe, that it doesn't really uh, respond to reason, actually. Um, so anyway, this, this anti-counter-enlightenment thought, the enlightenment is the great enemy of mankind, as, which seems <laughs> that's pretty hard to take. Um, and, and it's connected to, it feels, even in the 20th century, the post-World War II versions, it always felt eerily unaware of, its, uh, of the echoes of fascism in it. They don't really, and counter-enlightenment thought is acting as if they're inventing it anew, but actually this has been an old story. One of my teachers who was in Germany in the 30s uh, was a guy at Harvard, Sam Beer, anyway, he was a great man. But he said, the thing that the students who are most sympathetic with the Nazis, the fascist movement, the thing they were most upset by, you know what it was? Chain stores. They hated chain stores. You know, it's like the, the society of, because he said, anyway, this kind of, you wouldn't quite expect that, but it's an anti-modernization kind of impulse, which is very strong. Um, so anyway, I first felt a very great kinship with Amory. That was my first reaction. Um, and uh, I liked his mocking of Heidegger's orphic, hieratic expressions of forest irrationalism and saying that Adorno kind of denounced and mocked Heidegger actually uh, f followed him in his rage against technological industrial society, machinery cripples, machinery enslaves, such a, even though it's obvious to anyone can, that can see and who doesn't fear banality that like household apparatuses uh, free you from repetitive tasks. Amory's example is the dignity of farm life with, uh, is uh, greater with farm technology. Now, unlike I think, James, I didn't reread my Adorno and Horkheimer, but I do remember the feeling of exasperation I had maybe 50 years ago. So I'm not sure if my memories are correct, but I think Adorno said, or one of them said, the, um, the telephone is democratic, but the radio is totalitarian. That's because Adorno didn't know how to turn off the radio. That was what I always thought. Um, and I think he compared the queue buying tickets to a movie theater to the queue leading to the gas chambers. Now, could he possibly have said that? Yeah, anyway, I'm pretty sure it's there. But anyway, I'm not sure. I think it is. I, but I bet I can find it for you. And, Ho and Horkheimer, you know, Horkheimer has this great. He's, they're also, you know, they're very Heideggerian in this way. I, Horkheimer wrote, uh, "What is an elephant for modern technological scientific man?" An elephant is only a place where you cannot land your airplane in Africa. So it's a kind of, this is a distort, a weird view of the world, very perverse, and worth mocking, I think, of making fun of, which Amory does. And I think fear of banality is as good, well, it's not the only explanation, but it's a, it's a good approach to these kind of statements. And I do 
I mean, just uh, even though I've never written about these guys, I do think, and this is related to Foucault in a way also, that the best definition of critical theory is a theory that can't be criticized, that you want to position yourself in a place where you're invulnerable to being looked at, uh, and you're, you're not exposing yourself. You write in a way that no one can blame you for, in Foucault's case, you're not a subject, you're not an author, so how could you be wrong? Um, now, one aside, I have a couple of them here. Uh, Dorno, you said, Susan, said, uh, what is it exactly? Only exaggeration is true. OK, but better way to put this is Tocqueville's. If you don't exaggerate, no one remembers what you said. So I think that's a, that at least is a true statement, and I'm going to exhibit some of that. Um, and I, I just another side about Sartre. I did read the, one of the essays on Sartre, whom, of course, as we've heard, he admired. And I, he's very funny about Sartre. He says, Sartre, his whole life, dépassement, he's going to excel himself. He's going to put his past behind him, and he's making himself anew. And his last phase, he made himself into an infantile Maoist, which was the greatest example of obliterating your own reputation. And then he says this wonderful thing. He says, Sartre is in, uh, in Germany, was he in Berlin and the, in 1934? And he didn't notice, he was studying Heidegger and Husserl, and he didn't notice any, there were no Nazis. But in the 60s, in Paris, he didn't see anything except fascists all around him, which I think is a very acute and funny and profound uh, thing about what this rage to tear off the mask of bourgeois democracy and reveal the fascism. The fear of banality in that is also, I think, good. Nevertheless, on reflection, I realized that the spirit in which Amory is writing, even though I laughed with him and so on was not the same. So it wasn't in, I wasn't really in sync with his mind as I read further. I didn't have, I didn't have the same emotional experiential basis uh, for saying these things, for laughing in these ways. For example, and I, the thing that set me off here was realizing that I, I'm much more, I find it easier to say that the distinction between barbarism and civilization is, has some pop problematic aspects. For example, in the 18th century, in the United States, under the laws of war, uh, Indians were considered barbarians because they killed women and children. And as a result, it was permissible to kill them all. So that was how civilization and barbarism were distinguished. So you feel like maybe there is something to question here, even though, of course, if you look at Amari's experience directly, say, of course, I feel that's, that is a distinction that's really black and white. But, you know, I, my life experience, of course, is different than his. And this is why re reading uh, clarifies our personal uh, stories and background. It comes through especially the difference in his uh, essays on Foucault and structuralism. For here you see clearly that a man who felt reborn by the lucidity of the French language and the French rehabilitation of Dreyfus particularly felt personally betrayed by the France, uh, by the French intellectual tradition and the Cartesian tradition. And his feeling of betrayal at Foucault, these French writers, wells up. And that's why enlightenment and despair, the sense of betrayal, the enlightenment thinking from a sense of the tradition of the enlightenment has been betrayed by the place I went to escape German barbarism and German romantic barbarism. He was horrified by Foucault's anti Humanism, in theory, not in practice, he says. Um, and I'm, again, I'm working with vague memories, and I can be corrected by those who know Foucault, have studied Foucault more carefully. But didn't he, did, did Foucault say that the normative idea of reason led to the mistreatment of the mentally ill? I mean, I have that kind of some sense that there's something there. Anyway, as we heard just now, Amory describes Foucault as an extremely dangerous counter-enlightenment thinker who has darkened the French spirit and plunged it into an abyss of confusion. So that's very personal. It's very deep personal attack, not by, some, by a reader, by an American who's sitting as someone who, who felt uh, uh, that there was a, an act of destruction, a deep act of destruction that touched him personally. Human beings being dissentered, uh, human beings being dissolved into discourse, human beings as a cipher in a structure. They don't think, the structure thinks, doesn't Heidegger say, die Sprache spricht? There's not, nobody is speaking, the Sprache spricht. Strategies without strategists, powers without a power wielder. This is Foucault. So no multiple centers of power. 
no chance for power to arrest power. It's so, the, the passage from the beginning of Discipline Punish, his argument is that the French authorities brought the barbaric punishment into the walls because they thought it would contagious, it would spark violence in the public. It would be a contagious kind of violence, which means that the public has power. And that this is what I would call the liberalism of fear. That is, the power fears that their own violent behavior will have, will be, uh, there'll be a mimesis of it. And of course, that does contradict the idea that there's no victims and victimizers, there's no place for suffering, the lived experience that was at the center of Amari's thinking is nothing, memory is nothing, no place for the infinite value of human life, um, no, no interest in the attempts to relieve unnecessary suffering, they're all kind of, so kind of pointless to think about that. And of course, he's right in a sense, of course, right in a perverse way, leniency is more effective. I mean, you, you know, you get better results by giving the interrogate tea than you do by beating him in the face. Um, or pornography, which is the American case. They got much more. And there's a nice, this enlightenment thing. Beccaria, in his argument against torture, I love this argument, he says, uh, the thing is that you learn the most about a person by his body language. And if you're torturing him, there's no body language. So you really lose information. I think that's a typical enlightenment idea. And of course, torture creates terrorists, I think David said, but also the, Eisenhower said, don't torture your prisoners because you won't get anyone surrendering to you. You know, to give them, a, so it's a, it's, this would be, for course, you see, it's just efficient. But of course, and here I'm not so sure if Susan and I agree, the fact that power has an interest in humane treatment doesn't make the humane treatment any less humane. I mean, it can be that it, and in fact, we don't want to say, I think it would be historically implausible to say that the system of rights and uh, humanitarian norms that have been established periodically and uh, episodically, tentatively in history are, have been established because of the enormous lobbying power of the weak. That, that didn't happen. It must be that someone who has the capacity to put the norms and laws in place see some benefit from them. And I don't think that poisons or taints the fact that there is benefit to the people who could be potentially, uh, uh, who might be victims otherwise. Um, to say, as Foucault does, that institutions, think of them as institutions, as straight jackets, as opposed to, well, as Foucault I'm sure knew, in, a, a university is an institution that creates possibilities that, were, that wouldn't exist without the institute. You can study ancient Avestan, you couldn't do it on your own without an institution. It doesn't, you know, the institution is as a straitjacket. that's just a perverse way of talking about it. Okay, the philosophical extermination of the subject obviously was impossible to swallow for a person like Amari, who had the real ex uh, experience of the extermination. We've heard this of the person. Um, uh, he was shocked, not so much by Foucault's analysis, but he calls the um, euphoric the cheerful heartedness or something with which Foucault greeted the death of man. Um, that's not just fear of banality, by the way. That's a, that's a violation of elementary decency in a way. Not, I think it's more stronger words are required here. Uh, human experience erased in an intellectual game, Amari says. In fact, that kind of, the Foucault's world in which suicide would be meaningless, obviously. Um, it, and criticism of the author is also meaningless. Uh, and it seems like he's viewing the world from a place way above human experience. And the word experience, of course, for le vécu, the, the lived experience, which Amory kept returning to, has to have a place in the world. And it's something that just doesn't interest. I mean, you could say, why should, why should Foucault care about uh, everything in the world? He's talking about something else. But anyway, this is why Amory was so appalled uh, by Foucault. And, you know, the suggestion that democratic society is a carceral archipelago, uh, you know, uh, or, or the, the experience of human agency being destroyed or demeaned into a squealing pig. You can't read, when you read Foucault, you, there's something missing here, uh, uh, as is the too clever by half quip of Foucault that the soul is the prison of the body. You know, soul is the prison of the body. Maybe there's other thing in prison. We, should we use that word that way? And I always thought, you know, discipline is such a terrible thing. Like, 
Lapo is, you know, practicing his scales. That's like a discipline. That's, that's, that's taking away his freedom. Terrible. What a what a uh, uh, ben, what a. Uh, uh, a um, now, this experiential background reminds me of, of, of something that happened to me maybe that's 50 years ago, I'm not sure. I have a, some periodic amnesia, but I met a Romanian literary critic uh, 50 years ago, let's say, and he said, living in communist Romania is like living in a novel by Flaubert. I feel, we feel like a, an insect trapped in amber. And I thought this was like a very amazing and interesting uh, logic that helps understand, of course, like I mean, uh, Amari's amazingly passionate uh, engagement with uh, Madame Bovary. Um, his name, this guy from Manicre, was named Tertullian. Interesting, I know. I do remember. I think I'm pretty sure. Um, now I'm sure tomorrow, with people with much greater literary sensitivity than me, are going to be talking about this jacuzzi against. Flaubert, not just the lack of compassion, the sadistic contempt for bourgeois man without any sense of his citizenship, characters as playthings, mechanical beetles never quite warm. I think that's a phrase of an American poet. Um, it's stunning the way Amory just jumps into the novel as if he becomes a character in the novel. And he's not going to allow Flaubert to pin Charles to the wall like a butterfly. Uh, he even allows Charles to daydream about murdering Leon and Rodolphe. It's a daydream. I think that's a little bit like punching the guard. I mean, I, I don't know. There's some, I feel like there's some relation there. Rush, rescuing Charles from the amber. Um, and, of course, it's the same impulse, obviously, not to go more into the book on Flaubert, as his, his hostility to Foucault and structuralism to rescue the trapped and subjugated from the amber, even though it's just a daydream. And the important thing is he knows it's a daydream. It's just a daydream. He doesn't murder, even in the fiction, Leon and Rodolphe. You can't really undo what's done. Uh, you can't really go back to the novel and change it. But you're going to protest against it, because the right to protest against something that's wrong is a, human, a basic human obligation, you could say. Now, skirting a little bit Susan's We've already done it. No, there's a no-go zone about you know, torture, and so I'm not going to really go into the camps or anything. But it does seem that, obviously, that Amory's enlightenment is rooted in his personal history and in some kind of despair. And that's uh, so I, I want to look at two passages there. First, the great, wonderful one about the believers he meets in the camp, the believers, the Marxists and the Christians, both of whom have a future. This is related to what you can hope for. They both, there's a horizon, there's a future horizon to which they're oriented. They believe in the kingdom, their, their kingdom is the kingdom of tomorrow. It's a phony, it's a make-believe kingdom. The Marxist utopia, the Christian utopia, it's all just a lie, it's not true. No one who's enlightened can take this seriously, but they're much stronger than he is. It makes him weak. Uh, they have more distance from reality, they are captives of their fragile bodily individuality in the way he is. Um, they, they think they've, and they act as if they belong to something larger. There's an unfolding plot. There will be redemption in the end. Um, and that makes them strong in a way he envies, but of course he can't do it. He, he will never be like them and doesn't want to be like them. So that's the key. He, he doesn't say, and here's where I'm not sure that this is going to get agreement. He never says, we cannot face the future if we have not faced the past. He's not really interested in facing the future. That's the strong point. I think I'm agreeing uh, maybe with Peter here. He's, he's, he said he didn't, of course, like the way the Allies were sweeping Nazi crimes under the rug or had an hour of doing things for the future. He didn't like it. And we did it. The Allies did it because they had to face the Soviet threat. It was like, forget about this because the future is the main horizon. How are we going to deal with Stop with the Soviet Union. Um, and, but he didn't say, I'm going to be able to do better with the future because I faced the past. That isn't really his, the logic. And this passage, this passage about the Christians and the Marxists, is connected in some even deeper way, subtler way, with I think the most amazing passage in Jenseits von Schulden's Söhne, 
where he attacks natural, biological, and social time. He talks about the monstrosity, the monstrosity of natural time, because time heals all wounds. Uh, we, we, we forget what happened. The injury fades away, and uh, we don't, it doesn't hurt so much over time. But moral time is the opposite of biological time. It's the opposite of society surviving. It's the opposite because moral time isn't looking at a future horizon. It's just looking at the past. The monstrosity of the natural experience of time is such that turning toward the future is itself immoral, which is, in my opinion, a very violent attack on ordinary human beings. Or I don't know if that's the right way to put it. It's not, it's, I mean, Amory is distancing himself from human experience and what, other, what human beings normally do, which is they for, not forgive, but they turn the page, like Primo Levi, even though he presented. They, and that dispute really is, in a way, about this. Uh, are, if you, are you, and he says about himself, I'm, really, I'm kind of nailing myself to the past. I'm pinning myself to the past. And I know this is not what other people want to do, but it is. he is separating himself from humanity when he does that. And he's saying something that they are not going, that's going to be as incomprehensible to ordinary people as a text by Foucault. I think this statement. Uh, that uh, or, or biological social time is uh, is, is immoral. Is uh, you know, I had just a nice. This is proto Enlightenment. This is the common sense, I would say, of the Enlightenment. This is Francis Bacon. So earlier, but that which is past is gone and irrevocable. Wise men have enough to do with things present and future. Therefore, they who labor labor in past matters do but harm themselves. This is certain, that a man consumed with a desire for revenge keeps his own wounds open, which otherwise would heal. That's like kind of an ordinary, commonsensical thing, which is, um, uh, it's not that Amri doesn't know this. Of course he knows. He sees this, but he, he's resisting it. And he says, I'm making an absurd and inhumane way, to, or a demand that time you turn back, it's impossible, it can't happen, and it's absurd, and I'm doing it. Um, and this is, I don't know how exactly to break this, but I think it's, it's important to, understand, to focus on the fact that when you are nailing yourself to the past, you're nailing yourself, as he knew very well, to a particular past. All attention to great injustice is selected. There is no such thing as a non-selective attention to great injustice. And the principle of selection is pretty arbitrary. It's like where you were when you were there or something. It's not really a principled distinction uh, thing. And you know, I think when Bishop Tutu uh, handed over the report of the ANC to Mandela, nobody came because you know, the different groups wanted to hear about the crimes of their enemies, but not about their own crimes. People don't want to hear about their own crimes. That's part of tribalism. You only want to hear about the sins of others. And the people, I would say, who actually, individuals who can actually sympathize with the victims of the crimes of all groups, by definition, those are people without political legs. Those are people who have no capacity to rally political support. And I'm sure there are some people here who are like that, but then without really power. Because power actually depends on your taking a, a very biased, selective view and pretending that it is uh, definitive. I also like, we were talking with uh, Yvonne before, and there's a, this is a great thing about forgiveness and the future. Machiavelli says, it's much easier to forgive the murder of your father than the theft of your property. That's because you can never get your father back, but you can get your property back. So the thing is where you, where you don't, you know, forgive, because there's a, there's a future horizon uh, that you're, where you're trying to get something. But if you don't want a future horizon, then there is, you know, this is, there's, there's something about future here and uh, the horizon where you think you can actually reverse things. What is reversible? And Amory didn't think there was reversibility at all. Um, OK, just a little coda. And um, I don't know if Yvonne will talk about this, but there's a, it's interesting to see the difference 
between what we, what we see now. There are all kinds of resentments at past injuries that we know are too highly destructive. And then pinning yourself to past injuries like the stab in the back. The stab in the back, this was a great injury, we resent it and we're going to act upon it. And Putin says, you know, whatever it is, they, they stole the Soviet Union from us and we have to avenge it. So injury and the, and Amari, what makes him different from these actors who are using violence to try to revert, and Putin says that the Ukrainians have forgotten that they're Russian and I'm going to make them remember. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna allow them to forget this fact. The difference from Amari and the reason he's not at all like these people is because, exactly because, he knew his work and his talk about the past and focusing on the past could not, and he would never dreamed it would be, uh, actualized in an attempt to do that, to turn back, even though he says, this is what we are, I'm devoting my life to holding on to this memory against the natural flow of time and, the, and forgetfulness of time, uh, and I'm acting as if I could turn it back, but I know it can't. Okay. No, it's just if there's a certain secret, it gets very cold. But I think we should turn it off. Yeah, I'm finding it impossible to think in this. Um, oh. I, so if we either turn it on, if it bothers somebody, then we can open it. Well, we can give them a coat. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to say um, before we hear from anyone that for the um, online participants, please use the Q&A function and please formulate a question if you want me to actually read that question. Thank you. Uh, Susan. So, Stephen, as, you're, uh, as you suspected, there's something I disagree about deeply in the last part of your talk, not the beginning. And I really want to emphasize that I think uh, At the Mind's Limits is quite different from uh, the rest of Amory's work. Uh, for all that um, Dominic was trying somehow to figure out a way to put them together, I think it's actually not a contradiction. I think it's an antinomy, okay? Um, you know, in the sense that he lays out two very different pictures of the world, and they are in constant tension with each other, and he is constantly trying to figure them out. Yes, if you read At the Mind's Limits, which was published in 1966 as a, just a series of radio essays, you would think his whole life's work is devoted to hanging on to this memory, as you just said. But it wasn't his whole life's work. On the contrary, I think it also needs to be said, although I must confess, I reread a lot of Amory for this um, conference. I did not go back to At the Mind's Limits because I felt I'd read it so often I uh, know it. And m maybe there's something I'm missing in the, in, particularly in the essay on resentments. That is a dialogue with Nietzsche, okay? Nietzsche's concept of resentment and, and his entire discussion of, you know, uh, slave culture being built on resentment. And uh, it's one of the more brave and interesting things that Amory did was to say, hey, I was a slave. Um, and yes, you say there's something irrational about the wish to turn back time. Well, I'm going to give you a phenomenological description of that wish. And frankly, I think you said you didn't think that would be intelligible to ordinary people. I think it's very intelligible phenomenologically. I mean, I was never tortured and I was never enslaved, but I can think of, you know, I mean, getting over pain is a matter of letting go of the wish to undo time and to have it go backwards. I think it's a very normal human experience even in the face of lesser forms of pain than Amory had to go back. So, so I mean, I think the, the resentment essay needs to be seen in the context of his Hey Nietzsche, talk about slave morality, here it is. Um, 
And uh, this is why it's, it's legitimate. But I, I think that the bulk of the rest of his work is terribly future-oriented. Um, and yeah, I may have read more of it than you have, but the word progress always comes up. Um, the word, I, I mean, he's even much more hopeful, frankly, than I am at this moment in time, 40 some years later, in saying, well, we, you know, we're dealing with this whole irrationalist ideology now, but I'm sure the voice of, voices of enlightenment will triumph in the future. I am not sure. But he even says that in a couple of his last essays just before he kills himself. So I, I, I think one really needs to separate these strands of his thought, which, yes, need to be thought together, but are quite different. Is this on? Yes. Yeah. 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 So I'm completely ready to defer to your, your knowledge of Amory, which I don't really have. But he does, I think it is uh, true that he's resenting Germany at the time for the fact that it was a racing, trying to get past, uh, past it. So there's a historical context both what the Allies are doing, what the U.S. is doing, what Adenauer is doing, and so on. But he does present himself there as a moral conscience in a world that doesn't really have, or, or in the world around him, he doesn't feel any resonance of moral conscience. So he, there's an isolated quality, even though he says this is all about trying to overcome loneliness, it really is an expression of extreme loneliness and solitude of uh, himself, I think, at the time, for sure. So what happens later? You know, the, you, it's hard to read those essays about with Foucault and not say that there's something there that's replicating the erasure, the, the disappearance of the, the sufferer, the victim, the toothache, whatever he says, is just a lived experience. So, of course, it's at a much more, well, maybe playful in some cases, and it's polemical, and I think uh, jocular somehow. But it's, why is he so, the, the emotion which he puts into the Bovary book is, why is it, what is it, why is he so interested in the, the, in the insect trapped in amber? It comes from that experience where there's something can't move, that can't, that has no agency, that is destroyed. And, you know, Flaubert, you can write about him in all kinds of ways, but to identify him with something that is kind of a monstrosity of, treating you, you know, dehumanizing characters. That must come from that earlier experience. Uh, and I don't, if you say, well, he thinks that you could, I mean, the reason I like that book so much is that he's not really thinking that Charles can be rescued. Charles can't be rescued, but he's devoting himself to doing it. So it's not a purpose, it's not practical, it's not strategic, it's not hopeful, it's just saying this shouldn't have happened. So I'm, okay, I mean, I, I, you're, I'm sure, right, and I'm not, but I feel that the connection is there. Before I get to Moshe, I just wanted to add as a comment, I mean, this from, this, yeah, it's yours. I mean, this idea that, um, you know, this moral imperative, this idea of this, the moral wound that exists outside of biological time that you pointed out in the resentment essay, I mean, I understood that as a, as a, as a way of, for Amari to give moral language to what today is called trauma, right? The idea that there's a repetition, right? We don't integrate it into our past, but it's something that we relive in our everyday life again and again and again. But what I thought was interesting in that essay was that how Amari seemed torn about being traumatized and saying he was traumatized and being a victim. Um, and I wonder if part of his isolation or sense of being isolated from the world was also that he was struggling to, to <laughs> articulate a viewpoint where being a victim was not something you could be proud of, not something that you could talk about in public, unlike today, right, where victimhood can be worn as a badge of honor. Um, in fact, it, gives, it confers legitimacy on you, where he was very concerned that being a victim would undermine his position 
right? And he was constantly having arguments with himself in this text about, well, I know you're going to say that this is what a victim would say. Well, yes, but I have to insist on it despite that. Yeah, that's quite a good point. You know, the idea that justice is a, an emotion as opposed to a principle is confirmed by the fact that as time goes by, the punishments inflicted for the same crime diminish because people tend to, it's no longer so vivid to them. Same crime, the same act, if it's punished right away, it's punished very harshly, and as time goes on, it's punished much less. Now why? Well, because it fades with time. That's the natural process, which isn't, I mean, what, this is some moral achievement, it's just the way human beings are. Uh, and I think he rejects that. I think he doesn't, he's against that. He's saying, he's sta I'm standing against nature, and we have this right to do that. I f and I think that the book on Paris says, it affirms that position, uh, and not because he thinks it's, he does say it somewhere, I hope that maybe what I've said is going to be useful to someone <laughs> in the future, so he says that. Um, but uh, I think the, the general fact that time does something to crimes, I mean, we're, I mean, first of all, the peoples can disappear. Nobody is saying, well, look at the crimes that the Byzantine Empire was destroyed now. No one is really lamenting that. Uh, but uh, the past, you know, the past, there is no such thing as historical justice because injustices in history are just too many. They're just, it's the, all history is injustice, one after another. You can't cure that. You can't, you can't uh, remedy it. You're not going to make it right. Uh, and uh, so there, it's just the, the, the breadth and the depth of historical wrongs, what you can do is focus on your own experience and, and maybe think I'm representative because others who've gone through the same thing have also suffered, but to think that that's going to be part of a story in which justice will intervene, well, that would be pretty narcissistic, among other things, because all those others who have suffered terrible crimes and no one ever rescued them and who their voices have repressed forever their faces, have, what did Orwell say, the face stamped out by a boot forever or something like that. So I'm, I feel like that's more, I mean, again, I don't know. My, my sense coming from the book on Flaubert and the essays and a few other things I read, I would say that's at least true to part of it, I'm thinking. Uh, Masha, please. Well, thanks. This is really fascinating. I. I wanted to actually make a comment about trauma, which I think trauma has no closure, actually. Trauma defies, defies natural and, and biological time, social time. And I think uh, just to add that, what is the moral dimension? I mean, it's a psychological observation, is that for if I want to make an analysis, unlike the Marxist or the religious people in the camps, it's not only about the future. For a good analogy will be that for Amari, Holocaust was a domestic abuse, right? It's a case where you're beaten by your parents. Uh, it, it came from within a place that was presumed to be a home. Uh, and it, when that happened, and this is why domestic abuse is so traumatic, you lose you lose your sense of trust in reality because then harm can come from everywhere, even the place where you protect it. Uh, now, the, the Marxists had an explanation. You know, they had a theory that it had to do with capitalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, where, where is morality comes in? He thinks that the only the only way to put that memory into natural social time is by echoing this wound at home, which he was never really able to achieve. So- uh, You think he, he thinks it could happen? That trauma could, could be yes, reconciled? Yes, yeah. He says that. He says that, this is why he said, you know, right after the war, we were, we were thinking that really we are on the side of history, et cetera, et cetera. And then he realized 
with reconstruction, etc., cetera, et cetera, things are as usual. I mean, as if nothing happened. And uh, and here is he's insisted uh, strangely, he's insistent on the past has to is an attempt actually to come back to social time. But that's the only way to come back to social time. For, for an experience of trauma. It's like, I mean, from my own, my, own, my own experience with that, from people I've known, it's like one way of dealing with trauma, right, is to come back to the moment of the trauma and, and relive it in a way that it can be reached the closure. Right? Just, and that's what he's trying to do. He's not okay, well, hanging on to the past. Is not the exact description of what's going on. Right. So uh, the Enlightenment view of revenge, and I use Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments. He says people, what they want, of course, is not to inflict pain. They want the person who did the harm to recognize they did harm. So what Amory says about this is just ordinary. There's nothing particular about getting the person to recognize empathy, as you put it, looking for the, the to finding what you said in your talk, you know, finding a common uh, space with them because they recognize they did a harm, and that's what you're looking for. It's the, con you want to act on the consciousness of the person, and you want to bring them to have, see the same. So that's just enlightenment, that's 18th century, that's not a kind of post-Holocaust thing. Um, and I don't know how it's exactly related to Trump. I, I'm certain that modern social science has not paid attention to Trump. Certainly economists can't really deal with it. So there's some deep kind of sense of injury that, and of course the, the Amory phrase of losing trust in the world, which I feel, and I, I don't know if Susan thinks he's regained trust in the world by the not, end of his life. Not trust. But, but something. Uh, well, the moral obligation to hope. To hope, okay. My... All right. Yeah, that's, that's good. But um, I, maybe I'm too influenced by the poor um, but lovable American President Biden because every time he talks about you know, the shootings and he goes and he says, he goes and talks to the families and he says, I know you're going to feel, what does he say, I feel this empathy, the hollowness right here. But then after time, because his son died of cancer, his wife and children were killed in the car accident, after time, you can look back and their memory is a blessing and so you can you start thinking about them in a loving way and this is the way he talks to traumatize people. And I think what you're saying is that he can't do that. Maybe are you saying he can't do that? Are there something wrong with that? Because that's an ordinary way of talking. If you have been severely hurt, your wife and kids were killed in a car accident, you're just your little kids, and then your son who you adored died, of, you know, at the height of his career, and he was Traumatized, I guess. I'm sure he was. And his logic is to say, time will help. Yes, time will help. the analogy with me. A driver drove over your child because he, <laughs> okay. he was late to a party. And, it just, and then he's still there driving. Awful. Right? He's just driving. And in that moment, whatever Biden will say, it's not going to help, right? So, uh, um, so, I mean, sure. you have to enlarge it to a whole s yeah. world, right? So, the only way of actually coming back to social time will be an acknowledgement. So you, and maybe Susan too would say, that the aim is to come back to natural and social time. And that moral time, he wants to reconcile moral time with social and natural, I don't believe that. But maybe. Sure. maybe Words um, I, I, I think there's something really important about what Moshe just said. And I think it's about, and we need to remember, the resentments essay is not just a dialogue with Nietzsche. It is taking place where, uh, you know, there's absolutely no attempt on the part of the larger German public to come to terms with the Nazis and, and indeed the few Jews who want to mention it are explicitly accused of being resentful, okay? 
Um, and so, well, I agree. A drunken party goer who runs over your child, oh, perish the thought. And just possibly, um, you know, Amory's own sense of torture, of being traumatized by torture, is not going to be reconciled with social time. But at the point that he's writing, the whole society is, um, you know, in a very different place than it is now. Which is not to say that German Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung has been an unqualified success, we know, but, um, you know, that there's some acknowledgement in social time and space that these were horrific crimes. And I think, I've often actually wondered what he would think had he lived to see that. I don't know. Anyway. He was certainly, um, just to add to that, he's, he was very pessimistic in the resentment essay about what Germany would do with its memory of the war. I mean, he expected, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, and um, but there is this other passage too, where he imagines the, the you know it's translated as the overpowered and the overpowering, the überwältigt and überwältigend coming together and both wishing that that particular past never happened, and that would be the the and healing the heal passed. yeah yeah. Okay. Uh, Peter Gallison. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that I think is important to remember is that when we use the word trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder, this is a very recent concept as we understand it. There's an older, specifically combat-related issue of shell shock from mm -hmm. World War I, and they have other names for it before that, where people became incapacitated in warfare. But after World War II, there was huge resistance to the idea of expanding trauma in this way beyond its military application. And then specific objections from in Germany to extend trauma to those who were not physically injured or who were physically injured but survived. And Israeli opposition uh, in the early years of the, of the state to talk about traumatized uh, victimhood from the Holocaust because the state of Israel revived was supposed to create the new <coughs> the new Jew, the new Zionist, the new Israeli citizen, who would be, who would oh, not okay. bear the, 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 the insignia of, the, uh, of, a, of a traumatic disorder from an earlier time. So there were all of these movements combined, people not wanting to extend it beyond the military, people wanting to not talk in, in Germany, people wanting to not talk about it in Israel. There was a lot of, it took a long time uh, after 45, before people were willing to talk about trauma in the sense that we find so every day. So we use it as a transhistorical category. But it's very problematic. I mean, this is one of the things, I mean, I, I, I want to come back to Foucault. And, you know, I, Foucault doesn't do everything. I think your account of why Améry is, is resistant to it because of the anonymous murmur of the crowd the idea of a discourse as a set of ordering of what can go together, what can't go together, is does not leave a place for what he sees as his essential task. I, I'm very sympathetic to that. I don't see Foucault as a, you know, all point service for how to do history, but it opened up a whole new way of thinking about history through his notion of historical structuralism. Um, just the way, you know, when Braudel talks about event-based time, institution-based time, and geological time, you know, you can talk about the difficulty of autocratic rule of mountainous areas over geological time, in some sense, way beyond the rise and fall of kings and, and, and queens. But um, the event-based time does not, you know, there, there are different scales of things. And so you know, something like the, the, the idea of a, of a generalized trauma uh, that can be used in in states of people who are not physically injured but beyond the field of battle uh, is, you know, people can be injured in car accidents and through sexual assault or, you know, there, there are lots of ways that that gets applied. And I, I, I think that that's partly grappling with the lack of a vocabulary access, lack of a way of expressing oneself. And he mentioned, he talks about how hard it was to get to, the, Amari talks about how hard it was to get to the point where he could articulate and see, you know, what, what had happened to him, which seems to happen around 
1960 and the, you know, the beginnings of the war crime trials and so on. He begins to find a voice for himself. And, uh, you know, I, think, I, I, I find that very moving, actually, that, you know, the struggle to come to the ability to speak in, in that way. Well, these were great, great comments, very particularly about uh, trauma. But just let me ask you a question. How you situate Foucault in, you know, there's a way of, there's a definition of sociology, which is sociology is history with the events left out. Uh, so how, where is Foucault? You think Foucault understands events? I mean, he has a little story at the beginning, but events as an important thing for him? Well, you use this phrase, event, some, I didn't understand your point. You think he thinks about events? No, I was saying, there are kinds of history that don't account for other parts, right? I mean, there, there are aspects to history that are scale specific. And I used as an example, Fernand Braudel's The Mediterranean, where, where he divides time into these three scales, short time of the scale of months or years, which he calls event time, not Foucault, Braudel. And then there are these institutional right. things, and then there's this very long, which he called geographical time. I use that only as a metaphor to express that there are forms of historical argumentation, or Ernst Bloch on the way fields were you know, cultivated in medieval times as a way of under, you know, understanding a, a way of life uh, that has only left traces in the direction of furrows, for example. But I, 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 I'm just saying that I don't see Foucault as saying you, there's no value to talking about other aspects of history. Yes. Okay. And, and when he says, you know, the, the mind is, is the prison of the body, he's, he's making a polemical point, I think, specifically associated with the history of sexuality and, and saying that things that we think of as body-based can be shaped, conditioned, forbidden, allowed, encouraged, discouraged, uh, and that those come in not through the incapacities of our, our, our physical being, but they, they come in through our ideas and training and education and disciplining and so on. Um, we had the last question for this uh, this session is from Ivan Krastev. It's something extremely brief, uh, but it goes to something that Moshe said, and this is the problem of the victim's identity. And the problem of the victim's identity is it cannot be changed. The tortured body cannot become non tortured. So this is the appeal to others. If you want to reintegrate me, you should change because I cannot, not that I don't want. This is not the moral issue. In a certain way, I cannot. And from this point of view, he goes to the society and tries to explain that the only way for him to go back uh, in German society, you can go to Israel. This is a different story, but he never went there. And in order to be back to the German society, they should change because he cannot do it. And in my view, this is something that goes with this idea of loneliness. They don't understand that he cannot change. And for me, this is something interesting that I'm going to touch about. Victim's identity is very particular because it's beyond you. It's, you can decide to forgive, I mean, on one level, but you cannot change your experience totally. You cannot pretend that this was not there. Okay.